Welcome and thank you for your participation at the May meeting of the Nanaimo Historical Society, on site and in the field under a blue sky. Leading our expedition at Buttertubs is Bill Merrilies, a prominent BC naturalist whose interests span the spectrum of the natural sciences. After graduating from UBC with a degree in zoology and botany, Bill earned a master's degree in park management from Colorado State University, after which he became a naturalist with BC Parks Nanaimo Branch as part of a career with honestly too many highlights and accomplishments to list. Butter Tubbs is one example. Starting in 1984, Bill has led the effort to restore the marsh to its natural state and expand the Butter Tubbs conservation area. For the rest of the Butter Tubbs marsh story, I'm pleased, grateful, and honored to introduce Bill Merrilies to you. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm Bill Merrilies. You probably know me for one reason or another, some for better, some for worse. But uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome you out to the miner's cottage right here at the, at the, on such a lovely afternoon. Uh, I came somewhat prepared with a few graphics in here, but by holding the microphone and this underneath my arm and the traffic behind me, it's going to be a, a, a very interesting <laughs> experience to say the least. But uh, don't hesitate if you have any questions or whatever to uh, grab my attention. Um, it's very warm this afternoon, and uh, it's a mile and a bit around the, around the, uh, the trail, and so uh, the proposal is to cut it short. And I thought what we do is we'll walk down the dike as far as the viewing tower, and we won't be able, to, I don't think we can get 25 up on the top, and we haven't had it checked, by the way, for stability lately. So uh, we better not do that. <laughs> oh, I'll go first. The one that goes first lands on top of everybody down below. So, uh, but uh, I would just like to welcome you this afternoon to the to do this walk. And when I was asked to do it, I haven't hadn't been asked before, but it, I think it's a, a very fine idea, and we're glad to have you here. First of all. Uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Stebbings, the gentleman to my right. Michael's with Nature Nanaimo, and they are actively involved in uh, using the uh, miner's cottage here as a uh, education center, or they're developing in, in, in that way in conjunction with the school district of Nanaimo, and uh, so on, and it's very kind of him to come up and uh, open the door for us so you can all get a chance to have a look inside this historic building. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this aisle, uh, building what hasn't always been here. It was up, I think it was up Fuller Avenue one time, and the city moved it down and, and placed it here as a, uh, a typical uh, building that the miners lived in uh, during the early mining of, in Nanaimo. And, uh, you know, I'm so, I feel so lucky that I ended up arriving in Nanaimo because it's got such a fascinating history. G'day. And uh, first of all, uh, most people don't realize this, that, uh, you know, we all, when we talk about British Columbia history, we always talk about the great gold rush on the Fraser River as bringing all the people in, but that was not really the truth. Coal was discovered in, Ni in Nanaimo well before gold was discovered on the Fraser River, and people don't realize that. And so, with Nanaimo being the only coal source on the west coast of North America, north of San Francisco, it made it a very popular destination for a lot of the steamships to come in and provision up or coal up here uh, during their, their work. And so Nanaimo had a, a bustling community that started very early. And uh, all based on, on coal, which was uh, d discovered uh, down closer to the waterfront than where we are right now. The earliest settlers, of course, came over on the, what was the name of that little ship? The Princess Royal. And if any of you get a chance to uh, visit the uh, City Hall, Nanaimo City Hall, and you go in the north entrance, there's a beautiful painting there of the Princess Royal. And I'm trying to think of who the artist was, the Nanaimo artist that did it. Hardcastle. And if you, 
I have the original of that. My dad just happened to be walking down the street in Vancouver, and uh, I don't know when it was, and he got a chance, and he bought half a dozen hard castles, I think for $25. And one of them was the Princess Royal, and uh, I have it with the original typing of Hardcastle on the back. But I had to have a copy made for the city hall, and that's what we did, and we gave it to them. So that, that was the sort of the beginning. The very beginning of Nanaimo, of course, we all know, was coal. Right behind them, of course, the, uh, that was with the Hudson Bay Company, had the uh, monopoly on all kinds of trade on, in British Columbia, which was primarily furs and the fur trading industry. But when coal was discovered, that became a, a secondary line of revenue for the company, and they, it changed the whole complexion of the Hudson Bay Company, at least here on the West Coast. And with the Hudson Bay Company came in a bunch of surveyors. And uh, uh, the first one was, uh, was Pemberton. And uh, down at the mouth of the Millstone River, which we call Mafio Sutton Park, there was a place called Pemberton's Encampment. And uh, that was where he camped. And uh, he just so happened that he had, a, I'll call him a first lieutenant, I don't know how in the surveying hierarchy they go, but anyway, he had a fellow by the name of Benjamin Pierce. And one of the things that Benjamin Pierce was uh, charged with doing was to map out the Millstone River. And so th that he did. And somewhere in my papers here, It just so happens I have a copy from his original book of Nanaimo as it looked like in 1859. Now, I, I can't do the arithmetic, that was a long time ago. And uh, he came up the Millstone River and he discovered a beautiful grassy area. Would you like me to take that around for you? You can, uh, so I'll let you have a look at it. If you want a, a cleaner version, you can turn it over, but uh, pass that around. And so Pemberton uh, surveyed up the uh, river, and he came to a, a swamp. It's on the, on the map, 1859. I don't think they even had uh, Halliburton Street pegged out by that time, but anyway. But he not only came up the river path through here, uh, he didn't call it Buttertub's Marsh, by the way. It was just uh, the swamp, which they had to negotiate. And he then said, he said there was coal crops uh, outcrops popping up around here and uh, he described the vegetation and a few other things. Then he carried on up the river and uh, up where the, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, you all, most of you know where Stratiati Lodge is, you go down over the Millstone River, well there's that big field that the uh, uh, city of Nanaimo was acquired for recreation purposes. Uh, that uh, was caught, was, uh, he very boldly called it Pierce's Plain. And it was a big grassy area because the river would, would flood. The trees couldn't grow in the flooded portion, but when the water went down, it, it turned into, into grass. And of course, the Hudson Bay Company with its livestock, which was probably uh, ponies and things in the, uh, in the mine, and uh, cattle for, uh, for, for meat and, and milk and so on, the source of a... <coughs> A really good hay meadow was extremely important. And so a road was built up, and it was just called the Road to Pierce's Plain, and it's on, it's on that map, which is really quite interesting. Well, a lot of time passes over at the time until we get to uh, anything that resembles butter tubs. And uh, butter tubs, uh, I think everybody here knows their Canadian history and their British Columbia history and the significance of the year 1872. Anybody not know what it is, put up your hand. Be honest. Well, that was the day, that was the uh, year that uh, British Columbia sort of joined with the rest of Canada as a, as a Western province. So it became a province in 1872. But in 1972, we celebrated 100 years. And all the little communities around the province were given opportunity to, for a centennial project. I happened to be living in Castlegar at the time, and it just so happens I had a very interesting title. I was president 
You're not going to believe this. I was the president of the Kootenai Dukabor Historical Society. <laughs> now, before you jump to conclusions, I have never walked around naked in my life. That was the Sons of Freedom. That was, that was somebody quite different. But anyway, uh, I was president of the Kootenai Dukabor Historical Society, and we put a reconstruction of a Dukabor village up as, a, as our centennial project, and that was completed. I don't know what Nanaimo did, but anyway, uh, I just put that in as a little bit of history. It doesn't mean very much, but when all the celebrations were over, there was quite a large kitty of money left over. And I don't know who it was, but a couple of really bright people said, why don't we put that into a special fund? And the interest on that fund, we are going to be we use to purchase ecologically sensitive and valuable habitats. And that's what they did. The first property they acquired was in Grand Forks, which is a rocky hillside frequented by rattlesnakes. And the second was the purchase of Butter Tubbs Marsh. So it's really interesting when we talk about it from a point of view of a historical society, how this whole story sort of fits in, in, into context. And so what we're going to do is uh, walk part way around today. I think it's a bit warm to go all the way around, but we'll go down in under the shaded portion. We'll go down at least as far as the viewing tower where we can get a good look over the marsh, and you'll get a good view of it. And sometime in the evening or when it's a little bit cooler, and you have, if you've never been a walk for a walk around, it's well worth it. So that's what basically what we're going to do this afternoon. So I just thought I'd put it all in context from a, a historical society. And uh, as again, I wanted to say thank Michael and the Nanaimo Naturals for opening up the Miner's Cottage. Thank you. Boy, you, you, you all remember that. Okay, I'm gonna see how, what you did here. <coughs> Can you tell me what the name was on here for the early community of Nanaimo at the mouth of the uh, Millstone River? Colville. Hey, okay, you guys, you pass. Okay, we'll carry on. So that's the general story. And so in, uh, what was it, uh, 1969, somewhere in that anyway, uh, Butter Tubs was purchased and, uh, by the National Second Century Fund, which then changed its name to the Nature Trust of British Columbia. And uh, as a naturalist arrived in Nanaimo in 1968, uh, it drew my attention and I was involved through the Naturalist Club with uh, trails and improvements and so on. And since that time, we've uh, added a number of different pieces. The city purchased the uh, West Marsh in conjunction with, who did they partner with? City and I won't, Ducks Unlimited. And uh, then we've acquired other different pieces and we've slowly been acquiring land over the years. And eventually we got, end up with, we, now we have the trail around. Uh, the trail wasn't around when I arrived in Nanaimo, so I brought my cub pack up on Sunday morning, and we would sneak in the back road over there, and we were little snippers. We'd go snip, 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 snip. And eventually the, the, the trail was cleared. People could walk through. They thought it was great. They applauded the city council greatly. The city council gave them an extra 40000 for trail purchaser improvement, and so everybody was very, very happy. But right now, the uh, trail at Buttertubs, we, we estimate, somewhere probably between 80 and 90,000 people a year walk the trail. Uh, and that's probably a conservative estimate. But I like to think of it as a place of wellness. You know, I think of the Sun Yet Scent Garden in Vancouver or some of the Japanese gardens, you know, where people can come and just walk quietly and sit on a bench and enjoy and appreciate nature. And uh, that's what I think the big value is to Nanaimo. So, I've sort of covered everything that I really wanted to cover. Uh, yes, question? Oh, well, anyway, we were just talking about that a, a moment ago. Uh, <clears throat> before the nat uh, uh, Nature Trust of British Columbia, or as it was called in then, the National Second Century Fund, because it was a BC second century post whatever, um, <clears throat> that money was left over. And so it was, it was decided to, you know, purchase other properties. And it was slated uh, to be, a, you know, with Frank Ney and the rest of them, uh, 
a residential subdivision. <clears throat> it didn't, you didn't, didn't get that far, thank goodness. But anyway, nonetheless, one of the principals in the consortium was the Morell family. We know the Morell down the way. And Mrs. Morell came from Yorkshire in England, and she liked the name Buttertubs. And Buttertubs was a place, and some of you are just telling me that uh, cycle tours and so on, and uh, you often see it occasionally on, if you watch that program, Escape to the Country, Yorkshire. Buttertubs comes up mentioned there. And these were underground caverns where the farmers would take their cheese and, and butter and so on and put it underground during the hot summer weather to keep it cool. And that was where the name Buttertubs came from. So why did they choose that? What's that? Why did they choose that? <laughs> she, 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 she. I, I, I was born there. <laughs> just because she liked the name it was just and, that, and that's the and that's the answer that we, we've got for all of it and uh, I, I i agree with you it doesn't make it doesn't make a lot of sense but uh but it's i'll tell you what Buttertubs is a lovely name we've been the uh nanimo field naturals which predeceased the uh nature in nanimo uh when here we uh, wanted to buy a piece of a fellow over here wanted to sell the back of his property and he wanted $35,000. We raised $35,000 in just a few months. It's just a lovely name. It's got a lovely ring to it. It makes everybody people feel good. Some of them opened up their pockets and we were able to purchase it. So I think uh, that's the only answer I can give you. Uh, as I say, butter tubs didn't always look like, a, like it does today. So I'm going to just wa hold this up and let you have a look. This is what the subdivision, bird sanctuary subdivision, looked like at the time butter tubs was created. Now I show you this because things change. And if you're patient, they can change an awful lot. And that's basically what we're going to see this afternoon. If you realize that uh, it's hard to believe it, just how bald that is. And yet, you look out at the marsh today, you wouldn't believe it. So that's the story. What year was this bird sanctuary drive area? I'm going to tell you 1969, but I may be lying. But it was somewhere in, in that, that range. Uh, one of the interesting things is that this, this tells you a little bit sort of how the ownership works. There's a 99-year lease between the National Second Century Sun, a.k.a. the Nature Trust of British Columbia, and the province of British Columbia to manage the butter tubs conservation area. That's been, that was written back in 1975, and nobody believes it. We don't see the province of BC. Butter tubs is a place where everybody's business is nobody's business. And this has caused us tremendous frustration over the years. And we keep pushing the city. Matter of fact, we just had a, a meeting, didn't have a meeting for three years, despite asking Nature and Nanaimo, asking the city to call a meeting. We hadn't had a meeting for three years. And uh, anyway, we had a meeting about 10 days ago. And uh, the uh, community partnership wasn't very happy. But I don't want to dwell on that. That's not the point today. We want to get out and enjoy it and have fun. One thing I will tell you, first of all, we talk about the Hudson Bay Company and Nanaimo, but uh, Harold, uh, a guy by the name of Robbins was the superintendent of the company, and he planted, they, uh, 100 years ago, these, these, this big row of oak trees down here. So that's a, a bequest. They are English oak. They're not Gary oak. They're not uh, native oak. They're English oaks that were planted uh, way back when. So, And uh, here they are coming into into leaf right now. So look, let's uh, get, stretch our legs. As I say, it, it's very warm out there. I think we'll go down as far as the uh, viewing tower. And if some people then want to proceed on and go around, they can. Um, I told you I've got a, a split uh, nail on my big toe, which is quite painful. I'll make it down and I'll make it back, but I'm not going all the way around. So you'll pardon me if I don't make it. So if you have questions, catch me early, OK?
this is the uh, main water line for uh, North Nanaimo. And uh, so the city had just uh, made uh, uh, the recommendation to start, they have to expand the line because Nanaimo has grown so much. And that's what they're doing along the uh, parkway. Matter of fact, they wanted to come down the parkway, come through the West Marsh at Butter Tubs. And I'll explain that to you when we get down to the viewing tower. Uh, but uh, that was, uh, but uh, because they could, they, they were thinking about putting another line through this one here, a high pressure line, but they decided not to. And uh, I'll take you down here and show you a couple other things. Yes? What's the purpose of the patch of pavement down the road? Uh, let, when we get there, we will uh, examine that. <laughs> okay? Well, we stopped here for three or four reasons. One is somebody asked us about the blacktop earlier. On the ground. Um, this is the spillway, uh, basically from the West Marsh, which is on that side, to the East Marsh, which is on this side. And uh, the first purchase just covered the East Marsh and a report written by the Nanaimo Field Naturalist and distributed to the city and the Nature Trust and others suggested the purchase of other properties and the city pushed ahead and in partnership with Ducks Unlimited, they, purchased, they bought the West Marsh. And the general management plan is that the public can use the East Marsh for walking and all of the things there, but the West Marsh is basically for wildlife. And uh, Vancouver Island University, Eric Demers, has their bird banding station in the West Marsh. And they ban something like two, 3,000 birds maybe a year, migrate to measure and, and record the, their migration patterns and so on. To protect the marsh uh, with water flowing over it, that was why they put the, the blacktop in here. And you, have you all been here when the marsh has been in flood? because it'll cover this up to sometimes 15, 16 inches. And uh, that sort of puts an end to a lot of people traveling around it. But if you wade, you can get up to your knee, you can go all the way around. Right here, we under the ladies with the pink spotted umbrella, you can see a bunch of gravel on the, on the ground. That filled in a big hole. And believe it or not, the beaver in butter tubs tunnel into this bank and they tunneled in under there, had a den there for a number of years, and then they vacated it, and the weight of the blacktop and the red collapsed it, and just very recently, they finally filled it in. But there are, if you know where to look, there's probably half a dozen present and old beaver dens dug in underneath this dike because they're called bank beavers. They dig in under the bank and, and build their their little nest there. So, uh, does anybody know what time is best time to come and look for beavers here? Uh, you, what you do is you go over to the uh, uh, come out butter tubs drive, right, stop at, at the fence there, and look out between seven and seven thirty. And uh, one or more beavers will come out, and they feed on the water lilies that are floating on the surface. And all you see is a big furry head that doesn't move. All you can see is going. Did you pick that up on the on the tape recording? Um, 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 um. And that's the old beaver just chewing away on the. Uh, but because it, the beaver is not moving, nobody sees it. It's just there, just like a big dead head sticking up in the water, and uh, they're just there, chomp, 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 chomp. Although about a month ago, I, I, I and we're walking on the far trail, and there was a beaver about three quarter size walking right along the trail eating blackberry leaves. And we stood there and just walked right past us. When it got up there, it ran out, he came while walking back again. It was absolutely incredible. And you know what? I didn't have my camera with me. So you'll have to believe me. Um, the biggest question facing butter tubs right now is a, is a question of hydrology. And it's the management of water levels on an annual basis. And the naturalist community 
uh, in part, uh, assisted by the city, hired a company to put in some of these little recording things at about a dozen or so places along the Millstone River, East Marsh, West Marsh, so on, to record water levels. And I think they probably recorded temperature, they probably recorded oxygen content, and a number of other parameters. It doesn't matter, there's a lot of them. But anyway, the main thing we're interested in is water levels. <clears throat> and when we get a big snowfall or a, a big rainstorm, <clears throat> all the water off Mount Benson and its hinterland flows into the river and comes down, and comes down through the area which was known as, as Pierce's Plain and the swamp. And where the road, uh, you know where the road is out, the Bowen Road uh, goes past Quarterway Pub. There's the bridge over the Millstone River. That was the natural pinch point or threshold or bank that the river had to get over before it could flow down through Bowen Park. And so the water comes and slowly starts building back from there, builds up the, the main channel of the Millstone River, up about as far as the, as the highway bridge. Then as the level comes up, the water flows into the West Marsh. And it flows and down, and, th and that same impediment by the bridge, which, which has been taken out by the way, but it still functions. Water rises until it gets to the spillway and then it comes across here and then the East Marsh gets filled with water. So it's a progressive, first the river, then the West Marsh, then the East Marsh, and once these are filled, then it, the water just rises higher and higher until you have to walk through here, probably knee high and other places as well. We're trying to get, let me go back. So the original purchase was the East Marsh, and then we finally got around to purchasing the West Marsh from the fellow who owned Pride Vista Golf Course two owners ago. And the problem was, of course, is that the golf course would be flooded as well and it would all be flooded. <clears throat> so when he, he wanted to put another eight holes, golf holes over here, so he dug out, he, he breached the dike and he dug out a couple of ditches that drain the West Marsh. So when they, we get a high rainfall, the, 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 the dam by the bridge or the bridge there floods all the water up. As soon as it goes down, the water <coughs> stays in the <coughs> stays in the East Marsh, but it drains out of the West Marsh through the drainage ditches. So this will never <coughs> become a marsh like we have on this side over here. And that's been a very sore point for the natural, com naturalist community. And we kept trying to get them to plug up the ditches. And our thinking is that if you plugged up the ditches, the water would flow up to here, would flow over here. When the river went down, it would go down. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But it would leave water impounded here, and it would leave water impounded there, and they would just resort to their natural level of going up and down. But we can't seem to interest anybody in that process. And uh, we, we, we talk with the city on a regular basis and with Ducks Unlimited and the Canadian Wildlife Service and the Nature Trust and the province of British Columbia. And uh, we so far have been talking to a brick wall. So it's kind of frustrating, but we're, we'll keep at it and uh, hopefully we'll prevail sometime. So that's the, that's the story. Okay, any questions? That's a, a real technical one. Are there culverts under here? Or is it just, just one water line through there, underneath. This way. Yep. Right, right down. No, no. No, this is a, this is a dike that separates them totally. So this was built uh, at the time that the marsh was acquired, so it hasn't had a lot of attention since. And we have drawn it to the, uh, the management committee, and we've asked the city to send a person up just to test all the timbers and so on. 
and we might have, we've got some refurbishment. We did put a coat of paint on it a little while ago and uh, put new treads on it, but uh, we haven't done anything to it for quite a while. And uh, I think the cedar and all the rest of it is, is still solid. But, you know, if you, when you have the public coming here, you always want to just be, be careful. Okay, so this is as far as I'm going to take you personally. Uh, I'm going to stroll on back, but uh, those of you that want to go out, and we are about, uh, about a fifth of the way or a sixth of the way around the marsh. Uh, there are no facilities or water available for you on uh, that trail. There is a, a porta potty at that end, and the Quarterway Pub is just up the street a little way. So I think what I will do, uh, as I do have a vehicle, I think I will ask any of you want to saunter back with me, by all means do so. I think I feel like a, a cold pint, so I might just make it up to the, uh, as far as the pub, and you're welcome to join me. I wish I had deep enough pockets that I could pay for them all, but uh, anyway, I do want to. Yes. It's to do with the history. I read yeah. that this used to be something to do with the military. Could you maybe spend a couple of minutes on that? <clears throat> yeah, I can. Uh, pre uh, pre World War II, or probably post World War One, or maybe even during World War One, the uh, there was a training camp over here, and I was told that they used to run their tanks through here and so on and so forth for a while. Well, you know, the bottom is pretty solid, you know. Uh, we've got a lot of sandstone in Nanaimo, and it's not that far down below the surface. So uh, if you went down there, and I bet if you pushed the stake down, you'd, there's a good chance you would hit sandstone. Now, don't quote me and don't try it, but I believe that's the case. The interesting thing is, there's two mining districts, and believe it or not, one of the mines was on this side, one of the mines was on that side, and apparently there's a column of solid rock from here all the way down to the core of the earth. But on that side, you went down 50, 60 feet, there are great big cavities. And on that side, there are great big cavities, and they are not interconnected. So the two mining companies both mined from both sides, but they had to leave this. And if they mined through and uh, it caved in, we'd lose our water line. So uh, that hasn't happened. So it's just one of those interesting things that I've seen a map that shows us that there's just a, a, wet, you know, a, a column of, of rock here that supports it. Did that answer you? Yeah, there was a raid, uh, an antenna tower here, too? Well, there was. Uh, if, you, if you look over uh, where the uh, Osprey nesting platform is, when you look across, I didn't mention that, but that was the base for a radio communication tower during the war years with headquarters in Vancouver. When the war ended, Chubb Radio, did you know about Chubb Radio? Well, Chubb Radio, that became their radio transmitter. And then when they got a new, when we got new technology and so on, that t disappeared. But they left the platform there. So, smartass, who's the guy you're listening to, decided. He said, "What do you say we put an osprey tower out on on top of that uh, concrete platform that was there?" So we just so happened one of our members was a, a welder out at Harmac. Oh yeah, he says we can do that. You know what they did? They built the, built the tower. How are we going to get it out there? Helicopter. <laughs> and you know who supplied the helicopter? No. Hell's Angels. Oh so the Hell's Angels helicopter put the, put the Osprey Tower in. One of our members had an affiliation. <clears throat> and so, uh, and no man, and as soon as we put it up that first year, the Osprey started to build on it. And we have a lot of photographs that they did. But the Osprey population since then just has disappeared. There were, their Ospreys were everywhere at that time. They've disappeared, and we haven't seen any on there, although the herons and cormorants and hawks and other birds love, just love it as a view platform. And something we did just as a whim, and the, the guy responsible for that is talking to you, was to put some... Uh, purple martin boxes on there. And that is the only purple martin colony in British Columbia that's over fresh water. Now, why, I don't know, it just happened. And uh, Michael Stebbings would tell you, because they're the ones that are taking it over. And we put about eight boxes there, and they're completely full. And they the purple martin should be arriving any time now. 
And the reason why they're here is they, they largely like to feed on dragonflies, apparently. <coughs> well, what a great dragonfly habitat. So it's worked out very well. So we've, we've been really lucky when you think of all the things we've tried, and we've been very successful. And I, it, God, I'll tell you, it's been a lot of fun. It really has. And, you know, you also meet some really good people, too. Well, uh, no one's walked across, and, and nobody has. I've never taken a boat out there. We've never measured, but it's, it's not very deep. It's probably about that much goo and uck and grack, and about a little bit of water. Any fish? <coughs> fish, yes, um, but that's something. Who, who's got my pictures? Is there a picture of animals in there? Salamanders? Pass that picture around. There it is. Okay. Um, <coughs> the problem with, with, with fish in here is that uh, with all the uh, vegetation, it takes all the oxygen out of the water, so there's no oxygen. So we do have pumpkin seed sunfish in here, sticklebacks. These are small fish that they can, can live right at the surface so they can get the oxygen they need. But anything like, uh, you know, uh, trout or salmon or anything like that, no. But the interesting thing is we put traps in here overnight and we catch this salamander. And the picture there is about the size, they're about this long, big brown one called the Northwestern Salamander. Now, it is interesting. It is a predator. Anything it can get into its mouth, it eats. But if you put them in a, 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 a trap in there and you catch them underneath the O2 depletion, they die in a trap. But because they have the ability to come up and gulp air and they've got a lung as well, they can come to the surface in, in water. So they are the only thing that I know that can live here winter and summer. They can breathe through their gills and their skin in the winter time when there's lot, water's cold and there's lots of oxygen in it. In the summer is when it gets warm. They can sit down in the bottom in the cooler water and they can come up to the surface, gulp, and then go down. And so I proposed to the one of the profs at the university to do a study and tell me, is the salamander, is this the apex predator at butter tubs, the one that we really have to all be worried about? Or do the herons eat them? Well, the, the herons, what if they could catch them? But you know, these things are so dark, dusky, dark colored, and so on. And when you just come up and gulp and go down, the herons right now are waiting for the bullfrogs. Bullfrogs hibernate in the bottom. They're all cold and stiff. They come to the surface and they float there and the heron says, ah, there's dinner. And some of the uh, mergansers things and eat them too. So there's lots of things that eat the bullfrogs. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't surprise me if the salamanders ate the young bullfrogs and they, or ate the young tadpoles or whatever. So it would be a make a really interesting study. And I'm, I don't know whether I can twist his arm far enough to get him to do it, but it's just one of those things. No, no. Uh, the native frogs we have here is the little tree frog, you know, the little ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. Um, we have red-legged frogs here, but they're a forest frog more than anything else. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to say this is the end here. So thank you. I probably told you more about butter tubs than you ever wanted to know, but I say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being with you. On behalf of the Historical Society, Bill, we would like to thank you. This has been a fascinating tour, and this is just a token of our appreciation for today. I'm sure we all learned much more than we ever thought possible, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that'll be lovely. If anybody wants to join me, you're more than welcome.